Okay, good morning and welcome back everyone to our Tuesday morning market outlook session. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And looking at markets today, they are trading a little better than they were last Tuesday, but things haven't changed a whole lot with respect to where markets currently sit and what investors are largely concerned about. So we'll talk a little bit about that and what our views are are going forward. Before we get started, what we're going to discuss here today is purely for educational and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So we'll start off with an update of the market major market indices. Uh, they again, like I said, they look a little better, but things are not we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, so I want to point to what are the major levels to pay attention to. Then we'll take a look at the sector rotation data, which also shows some cracks starting to form here, but uh, very early days, not quite enough to inform uh, a larger view just yet, but uh, important to understand where that's currently headed. Uh, looking at the fixed income markets, again, not a whole lot has changed there from uh, still trading largely at the same places that we are, but we have seen some major moves with respect to commodities. Uh, if you look across the entire commodity spectrum, as well as Bitcoin, obviously big moves last week. So we want to talk a little bit about what changes we've seen there. Uh, economics change uh, indicators that we have changed seen on the economic side, and then share with you some of our top ideas for navigating the current markets that we're in. Now, a bit of housekeeping here before we jump in. Uh, we have quite a bit of um, an action pack calendar for you coming up this week, uh, but I am out next week. So we'll be resuming the following uh, following week after that. So this week on Thursday, uh, we're going to be doing an event on trading index options, the top three strategies for trading index options. Now, just to remind everyone, this is going to be at 3 p.m. Eastern on Thursday instead of the normal 4.15. We're doing this at 3 p.m. so that we can actually show you live quotes during the event. So so this is coming in an hour earlier than we normally do on Thursdays at 3 p.m. This Friday, I'm doing a thematic investment series on the future of e-health, uh, the future of healthcare and what that's going to look like. And like I said, I'm going to be taking a week off after that Friday thematic investment series. And I'll be back Tuesday on June 8th to do our next Tuesday market outlook to give you an update on where the current market currently stands. And then that Thursday, we're going to be doing another 3 p.m. session on Thursday because we're going to be trading uh, small futures live with Jamal Chandler from Tastyworks. Now, while I'm out, I will be publishing a chart book so that you will see the same charts that I will sh typically show here during our Tuesday market outlook so that you are not left out from what I what our views are for these sessions. So just a reminder, again, I'm out next week, but we will be publishing our chart book so that you can still stay on top of the markets and the major indices and what we currently see here in the broader markets. But the primary question that I want to help answer investors for today is have equity markets shrugged off the inflationary concerns and ready to resume its uptrend? I think a lot of investors are waiting for this. A lot of investors want that to happen because uh, a lot of investors may have sustained some losses here over the past couple of months and want the equity markets to resume its bullish trend to potentially try to recover some of those losses. So my name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And I want to share with you my technical research, my economic research, and the ways that I'm viewing the current market to inform my directional outlook for the equities and other markets. So let's first start off with the S&P 500, which remain in this very strong bullish trend here. Last week, we talked about two gaps. We talked about a gap here to the downside, and we talked about a gap here to the upside. Now, the upside gap has been filled, and we've now broken above that level. So largely, we are trading better than we were last week. We still have this all-time high here around 423 to contend with. If it can break back above that level, that certainly is bullish. But the fact that this lower gap here remains unfilled, turning to me, uh, that I usually like to see these gaps fill before they continue moving significantly higher here. So this is one that we have to pay attention to uh, in in the equity markets because you know, so far we haven't broken above this resistance level and we very well could just trade more in a range bound manner until we fill this gap and then potentially have the opportunity to continue moving higher here. Uh, 
at the at, at the end of the day, none of us have a crystal ball. We don't know where the markets are headed, but that's where I'm uh, looking at for the S and P 500. When you look at the QQQ, there are still certain things that on the longer term chart that concern me is the fact this negative divergence that we've been talking about for quite some time continue to be an issue where we make higher highs on price, but lower highs on momentum. And you can think of momentum as uh, the measure of the accelerator pedal as a car is going up the hill. And as we go up the hill and make higher highs, if the accelerator pedal is no longer uh, accelerating and it's actually decelerating, that gives us a sense that this this is perhaps reaching near a, a, top, a top and may start to fall back down. Now, the reality is that divergence like this doesn't necessarily lead to a sell-off. It very well could just lead to more of a con sideways consolidation range like we have seen in some of the other markets like the small cap Russell 2000 index. So if you look at the, uh, the QQQ, this really looks more like a trading range rather than anything else. And we've largely have been range bound from this December to February high, and we've been just trading within this range since then. So that's really what we're starting to see here in the equity markets is that we're not quite, we're certainly not bullish here anymore, but we're not bearish here. We're just very neutral going forward. And that's my view as far as how equity markets are currently trading. And when we get near the top of that range, perhaps it's it's time to look at selling some cover calls, looking at selling some call credit spreads. And then when we get to the bottom of the range, look at selling some put credit spreads. This is more of a neutral place that we're currently in, especially as interest rates kind of stay in this 160 basis point equilibrium, which is something Thing we're also going to take a look at here as well. And this is the most pronounced in the Russell 2000 small cap index, where we've seen a strong move here to the upside, and then a very clear trading range or consolidation range that we have seen here on small caps. And the question is whether this continues uh, to break out here to the upside or it manages to break out to the downside. Now, I don't really have any concerns that equity markets are going to break to the downside per se, uh, but you know there could be something else coming down the horizon that we're currently unaware of at the moment in terms of uh, you know that could drive a, a catalyst or drive a, a move here to the downside. But the important thing is to first view the established range, be aware of that range, and look for breakouts outside of that range. So right now, we're very much inside of that range. And then when we look at the, the equal weight S&P 500 index, this is really where market breadth is starting to show some cracks because as the S&P 500 is revisiting its, new, its recent all-time highs, the equal weight S&P 500 index is not revisiting those all-time highs. So the broader, uh, the, the, the leadership here in the S&P 500 has narrowed a bit. Now, I will say that the, the narrowing of this leadership is at this moment very small and very early days. It's only lasted for a couple of days. So that in itself is not enough to make draw any conclusions, but it is starting to show some of that. So if this continues to go on for quite some time, that would be a larger concern for us for the current equity market rally. There's also, you know, other things that we can take a look at in terms of evidence that markets are sort of complacent, which we typically see near market tops. Uh, the VIX uh, futures curve, the front month VIX is pulled back all the way to 18 and a half. The three month VIX is still above 22%. So we have a pretty big divergence between the front month and three month VIX, meaning investors are more concerned about volatility a little further down the line and very complacent about fear in the short run. This level of this divergence in terms of complacency, uh, I'm sorry, in terms of volatility usually shows that there's a fair amount of complacency in the short run. This level of complacency is never particularly good for uh, bullish investors. It's really more of a fear um, uh, indicator that things are a little bit frothy, that uh, that uh, traders may have kind of their um, fear gauges off here at the moment. And so usually in those times that we tend to see uh, market tops and we tend to see some sell-offs. Now, granted those sell-offs, because we're near the top of the range may not be particularly large. It just brings us back to the bottom of the range. But these are some of the evidence that we're starting to see here. And then we look at emerging markets. Emerging markets also quite weak here. Nowhere near its all-time highs here in February, not even near its recent highs here back in uh, late April. 
uh, showing fair about a fair amount of weakness here, actually trading in this more of a downtrend rather than a, you know a resumption of that uptrend. And and very well you could say you know trading in a very small range here at the moment, looking for that breakout, but not there yet. So. Emerging markets, uh, I mean, domestic equities looking stronger than emerging markets, but emerging markets so far not looking particularly strong. And then when we look at within the equity markets here in the US, uh, looking at where there's strength and where there's weakness. We've talked about this uh, underperformance here of value for multiple years, the consolidation or bottoming formation we've seen in terms of value, and the recent breakout where value has under uh, has outperformed growth. First time we've seen this in many, many years. Uh, came back to retest this level all the way as support and managed to hold those levels. So this is showing us uh, that we are holding these support levels and so far value perhaps will continue to outperform at least that is still my thesis that if you're looking for um, uh, equity positions to establish in this type of environment, you're better off looking in towards value rather than growth. And then when we look at the sector rotation model, this is again where we start to see evidence of uh, concern, right? Because right now we have energy, we have in, uh, materials, we have financials, we have industrials, we have consumer staples, we have real estate, and we have let's just call it utilities moving in this particular direction towards the lagging category. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven um, uh, sectors, and, and sorry, and also healthcare. You have eight sectors moving towards the lagging uh, quadrant. And then you really have technology, you have discretionary that's sort of improving, but not quite just yet. Uh, and consumer uh, and communications that's moving towards the leading category. So you have three sectors, uh, and largely, I would say two sectors that are leading or moving towards leading. And then you have eight sectors effectively weakening or lagging behind. This is the type of price action that we saw in late 2019, in late and to, an, an early 2020, before the coronavirus sell-off, where you just had technology and discretionary largely dragging the markets higher, and the other nine or eight sectors just basically flat or, or lagging behind there. That is not the sign that you want to see as a healthy market rally. Uh, those are usually signs of an unhealthy market rally. So this is really some of the things that we need to pay attention to here in the broader markets um, in terms of how we currently are looking at uh, the markets. Now, this is something that has only exhibited for a few days. So that is not enough reason to say, uh, you know, we are near the market tops and we're going to start to sell off here. But if this continues on for a few weeks, potentially even a few months, which is what we saw in late 2019 or early 2020, those are the signs. Those are the major warning signs that we see near a market top that typically lead to very strong and violent sell-offs here in the broader markets. So we've seen this multiple times. They haven't lasted. Uh, we saw this uh, a few months ago. I had brought this up. We have seen this um, throughout the the moves uh, higher here from August to September of last year as well, but they didn't last. And, and those are, and, you know, when they don't last, that's totally okay. Uh, so this is one, like I said, very early days, only we've seen this for about four to five days right now. If this continues, that is a concern, but it may not continue at all, but it's important to understand that these are developing. And then when we look at technology, we start to see technology start to out show a little bit of outperformance here. And we showed you this chart here uh, a few weeks ago where we've seen technology in a very strong uptrend. And because we're near the bottom of this range, our expectation was that it was going to start to outperform. And that's exactly what we have seen here over the past uh, a week or so. Since we talked about this last week, we talked about it near the bottom of this range. Our expectation is gonna, it's gonna head back towards the top of the range. So far that is still playing out here there's a minor resistance here around 143 or so before it can get back up to that 147, 148 uh, top of the range here. So, so far technology, certainly one of the places that are showing a bit of strength here, but we do want to be careful when we're positioning within technology, what uh, spectrum, if you will, within the technology space that we want to pay attention to. And also real estate. Real estate 
you know, showing quite a bit of strength here, but near this triple top here. So be careful. If it does break out above this triple top, this certainly puts real estate in a good uh, spot here. But, you know, we're starting to see some cracks show here within real estate. So this very well could fail and go back into that trading range. So while this is one of the strongest sectors here, uh, this may be more of a range bound play rather than a breakout play that we're starting to see here emerge from a lot of different sectors. And then interest rates. For those of you, I hope many of you were able to catch my session last week with Frank Caberna from uh, Taste, uh, from uh, the Small Exchange, where we talked a little bit about trading interest rates, both on short-term scalping strategies for those of you that are active traders, as well as longer-term investors. And you know, we talked about the fact that interest rates are mean reverting, meaning they tend to, uh, when you see outsized moves to the upside, they tend to to fade. When you see strong declines, they tend to rally off of the back of that. And that's largely what we've seen here from 10-year yields around this 160 basis points. 160 basis points effectively acts at a, as a magnet. Whenever we have strong dips, they tend to uh, fade. And then when you have strong uh, um, declines, we tend to see that rally back towards that 160 basis point level. So far, we're just still stuck at this 160 basis point level. So this is showing that interest rates are, are somewhat um, uh, in this equilibrium state, which is better than interest rates moving higher for equity investors. So in this particular state at the moment, this is part of the slow confidence building that some equity investors are starting to see and why we're starting to see markets trade a little better than they were last week because uh, we're seeing that uh, interest rates have not uh, continued to move substantially higher above this 160, 170 basis point level. They faded all of the moves higher here. That is uh, constructive here largely for equity markets, but this is one that we really have to continue to pay attention to for the longer term views here for uh, equities. And then when we look at gold, uh, we've seen some substantial moves here in gold. We've talked about this here over the past few weeks. We've been constructive on gold since it broke out above this 160 basis point level. It's managed to break all the way back up to its 200-day moving average. We said that that was a key level to pay attention to, and it finally broke out not only above the 200-day moving average, but also this uh, very long downtrend that it's been in since the August of last year. So the fact that we've broken above this downtrend puts this 183 uh, high back into contention here. So gold looking very strong here for the commodity markets, uh, probably the strongest of the commodity markets that we have seen compared to pretty much everything, including Bitcoin, which had uh, one of its worst uh, weeks uh, over the past couple of weeks. Bitcoin coming back and just to look at Bitcoin, you know, on a, on a larger scale, we had the major breakout here above 20,000. Uh, came back all the way to test this three, uh, 30,000 level here to the downside before continuing higher here to the upside. Now, this upside move really looks uh, not too different from a, a classic head and shoulders pattern, just that it had four, uh, you know, effectively two heads and two shoulders uh, as opposed to one head and two shoulders. But you know, a topping pattern, very much the same, right? Especially as you go from left to right shoulder, we see declining volume. This was really some of the warning signals that I had spoken about here in terms of showing that you have this massive move higher with higher highs, but massive divergence here. Same thing that we're starting to see here in QQQ, where we see higher highs in price, momentum no longer confirming those highs. And that led to a very dramatic sell-off here. And you know, in the history of Bitcoin, this sell-off from a percentage perspective is relatively similar to previous sell-offs that we've seen of this magnitude, about 50, 55 percent. Now, what's interesting is that Bitcoin managed to get all the way back to the 30,000 level here, we literally touched it to the penny, right? Um, came back to hold that level as support. So far, the 200-day moving average now is acting as resistance. So you basically have established a trading range between 30,000 and roughly 40,000. My expectation is that you're likely going to see some volatility and some chop around here and then potentially resume its bullish trend here at some point going forward. But you know when that's going to happen is really hard to say. Uh, but this is really my expectation is that you're going to see more of a range-bound play here before you can see a breakout here. But this is, you know, as, as much as this probably hurt a lot of Bitcoin and maybe uh, cryptocurrency investors, this is healthy, you know, because when you have an, uh, you know, an asset that goes from 20,000 to 65,000 in a span of a few months, that's not healthy. 
uh, you know, markets can't just go straight up. They have to consolidate. They have to pull back here. And we've now we've seen the pullback here. That once you pull back here, many times it tends to consolidate for a little bit of time, uh, you know, before they can continue to move higher here. And that's largely what we're seeing here. So for Bitcoin investors, especially for those who are long-term investors like myself, these sell-offs are actually are actually a good thing. Um, you know, when you see assets that just go crazy and parabolic here to the upside, that should scare you. Um, you know, when you see those parabolic moves, those are times to take profits. And then when you see them crash back down again, those are opportunities to get back in. And then when we look at other commodities like crude, crude is stalled here at the sixty-six dollar level. This is a long-term resistance level that has been here since well before the pandemic. And you know, if you look at OPEC, this is really the, the comfort level here for OPEC. It's enough for the uh, OPEC nations to be profitable, not quite profitable for the US shale companies that have a higher break-even price in the high 60s, uh, I'm sorry, low 50s, uh, high 50s, low 60s or so. So just barely profitable for those companies. And I think OPEC is largely very comfortable for oil to be in this particular state. Um, so we're likely to see, uh, you know, in my opinion, more of a range-bound motion here for oil pricing as well, which is going to put a bit of a cap here on XLE and energy companies in terms of what those out, what the outlook for energy that has been very, very strong here since uh, the November election. I think some of that strength here is going to start uh, weaning off. Looking at some of the, uh, the industrial uh, commodities that have really taken off here, lumber, copper, steel, um, also seeing quite a bit of a sell-off here over the past couple of weeks. Uh, and we've talked about this also as well, because we saw this higher high in price and then starting to see divergence here in terms of momentum here, leading to a bit of a sell-off. Now, this is one that we're going to pay attention to because uh, this 430 uh, level here, 435 level here on copper is a major uh support level. If it breaks below that level, we may be headed back down to about $4 or so on copper. That would put a pretty sizable dent here in many of the mining stocks that have really taken off here, industrial stocks that have taken off, even Caterpillar, um, uh, you know, mining stock, mining um, construction um, or mining equipment companies like Caterpillar will likely see some sell-off here. So industrial stocks coming under pressure here as these commodities starting to um, ease off their all-time highs. And then, you know, the, the, uh, the only economic indicator that I think investors are currently paying attention to here at the moment is really inflation. And inflation is, is, um, can be measured in many different ways, uh, whether you're looking at CPI, whether you're looking at wage inflation, whether you're looking at raw material pricing. Uh, but if we look at that type of inflationary data, we've seen uh, levels that we have not seen over the past 20 years. So this is why this has spooked a lot of investors here. Also looking at just Google um, uh, search history for hyperinflation, also at uh, multi-decade highs. So the question is not necessarily uh, you know, how much inflation is there? The question is whether this is going to be a long-term concern or this is merely a short-term transitory concern, uh, kind of the growing pains, if you will, of the reopening from what is the fastest recession and also the fastest recovery from a recession that we have ever had on history. So far, when we look at uh, economic forecasts. The answer is that we believe that this is more transitory and short term, that it's going to resolve itself throughout the rest of the year. Because as we look at uh, the inflationary expectation differences between 2021 and 2022, they are divergent in terms of path. And this is Bank of America's expectation here in CPI after April, as you can see, expecting that slowdown in terms of uh, inflationary um, uh, to, to still grow, but decelerate and then start to actually slow down a little bit here towards uh, the second half here of this year. So this is where we look at at least the evidence right now seems to point that point to the fact that this inflationary concern is transitory, that it is temporary, and, and that's why equity markets have largely held up its gains so far. If the markets were expecting uh, higher inflation next month and the month after that, I think that equity markets would probably be a little weaker than they are right now. However, this is one that we really have to pay attention to. If, if inflationary concerns continue, uh, perhaps at a faster pace than we expect, or maybe uh, um, are, are um, 
more permanent, meaning they long, they last longer than we expect, that is definitely going to put a huge downside pressure here for equity markets. So this is the one major economic indicator that we need to pay attention to as equity investors, not only for the short run, but more importantly, also for the long run. So as we look for opportunities here in the market, we really have to be very hyper-focused on thematic plays and be aware of where we are in the economic recovery um, and, and as also take taking a look at that sector rotation uh, data to give us a better sense for where we want to be positioned within equities. So uh, I'm bringing up airlines because we have largely swept airlines, uh, you know, kind of under the carpet here for the past couple of months after having one of its strongest periods from, uh, from beginning of the year to mid-March or so, when there was a lot of interest in reopening and a lot of interest in kind of what the airline industry is going to look like. And then once things actually started to get better, uh, we saw a huge contraction, a huge um, a correction here in many of the airline stocks. Now, if you look at the, the Jets ETF, right, uh, you know, pretty much most of the major airlines look very, very similar in terms of price action. So it's you know, difficult to actually pick a specific airline here, but you really have the international airlines, Delta, United American Airlines, and then you have uh, the U.S. domestic carriers, at least for U.S. equity investors to invest in. And when you look at the, uh, the, the landscape here, like I said, most of the charts look fairly similar here. The reason that I'm picking Hawaiian Airlines as their daily play here for today really comes down to the fact that of trying to pick a U.S. domestic carrier that has seen better booking data than the other ones, if possible, if there is any difference. And Hawaiian Airlines certainly seems to be uh, leading in the pack in terms of domestic travel. It doesn't have very much exposure to corporate travel. So it very much is back to almost 100% operational uh, capacity as it was prior to the pandemic. Uh, one of the fastest airlines to get back to there. It's also an airline with relatively low amounts of debt. And it's an airline, uh, at least from the, uh, from the options market, fairly liquid, uh, more liquid than some of the other ones that we also like, uh, such as JetBlue, um, as well as Alaska Airlines. JetBlue and Alaska Airlines, not as liquid from what we saw. So that's why we chose Hawaiian Airlines as our daily play here for today, holding this $23 support level here, uh, consolidating here for the past month or month and a half here or so, and we believe ready for its ne next leg higher here going forward. So Hawaiian Airlines is our daily play here for today. And then the inverse of the reopening and the recovery here of back to normalcy is really some of the stocks that uh, took advantage of the lockdown and is now starting to see some weakness. So we've been bearish on Etsy. I've remained bearish here on Etsy. We were bearish as it broke below the $190 level going into earnings. So far after recovering a little bit, it's still continuing to get rejected at both the 200-day and the 21-day moving average and starting to move lower here. So I believe there is another leg lower here for Etsy. My preference here is to sell call credit spreads because implied volatilities are relatively elevated instead of buying puts. Selling call credit spreads allow you to profit even if Etsy just trades sideways here, but will profit even faster if Etsy does drop to the downside. And then lastly, when you're looking within tech, because it is the only sector out of the sector rotation model that's showing strength here, uh, it is important to also take a look at some of the tech names. And the question is where in the tech names? Do you look at the higher beta tech names, uh, the faster growing tech names, or do you look at uh, the, the dominant players? For, for me, as I go back to, to my statement that I believe that value is going to outperform growth, the answer is stay away from the unprofitable, higher uh, growing tech names because they are still continuing to trade at very rich valuations, even though they have come down quite a bit. But focus on profitability, focus on companies that's going to be able to return capital to you as an investor, either through dividends or through uh, share buybacks. So looking at Microsoft, Facebook, uh, Apple, these types of names are the ones that you want to stay in in this type of market environment. So all of those, in my opinion, are very similar in nature. Facebook, uh, you know, I'm simply pulling this out because uh, it has after, after range bound for almost nine months or so starting to break out here to the upside, came back to confirm this breakout level as support and is now continuing to resume its continuation higher here. Selling call credit spread, I'm sorry, selling put credit spreads are suitable. Um, also buying long dated calls are potentially suitable for this type of name or just outright buying the stock itself is also suitable. Um, <clears throat> but taking a look at a more of a longer term approach for some of these value-based 
technology plays. So with that, that covers what I wanted to share with you here today. I hope that this was helpful in giving you a better understanding as to how to view this current market. It's not a particularly easy market to trade, but you know, largely we're not out of the woods yet. We're in this range bound mode. My expectation is that we may stay in this range bound mode for quite a bit, a, a bit of time. So make sure you position correctly for that range bound mode as we get to the top of that range. Look for some selling opportunities. We get to the bottom of the range. Look for some buying opportunities. Not necessarily expecting big moves here from equities over the short run, um, unless we really break out here to the upside. So with that, I want to thank all of our members for, for supporting us and allowing us to continue to do this every single week. And again, don't forget, next week I am out, but we do have an action-packed uh, session this week on Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern, not our normal 4 p.m. We're doing it at 3 p.m. this Thursday because we want to show you some, some trades that we can do live together uh, when the markets are still open. Friday, I'm doing the thematic investment series. And then next week when I'm out, we will be publishing a chart book. Basically, you'll be getting my slides uh, that I normally do on the Tuesday morning market outlook sessions when I'm out so that you can stay on top of the markets and understand what my views are when I'm out. And then I'll be back here uh, two Tuesdays from today doing our next market outlook session when I'm back. So with that, thank you so much. I hope that you guys have a great trading day and I'll see you guys here on Thursday afternoon.